Okay, great. Okay. So, good morning, UConn students, faculty, and community members. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the second day of the first annual Human Rights Symposium. My name is Edna Alic, and I'm a senior at the University of Connecticut, double majoring in psychology and human rights. My interest in human rights issues spread from migrant advocacy, peace and reconciliation, and relevant to today's discussion, genocide awareness. Um, thanks to our chair of the subcommittee on genocide and ethnic cleansing, Bree Dyer, we will be dedicating the whole day to genocide prevention and awareness. We aim to represent and discuss the stages of genocide throughout our discussions and events from today. From topics of law and language pertaining to genocide to issues of cultural destruction and ethnic cleansing. We'll end our day by remembering prior genocides to combat genocide denial. In the recent years, we have seen the stages of genocide manifest themselves with the Rohingyas in Myanmar and the Uyghurs in China. Now more than ever, we need to stand firm in our advocacy against genocide and, how, and understand how critical it is to act fast. We'll begin our day with our keynote presentation by Dr. David Simon. Dr. Simon is a director of the Genocide Studies Program and the director of graduate studies at Yale University. He is also a member of African Students Adversity Adversity Board and has served as a consultant for several UN agencies, including UNDP, UNITAR, Office of the Special Advisor for the Prevention of Genocide, and the Millennium Development Project. Without further ado, Dr. Simon, I hand it off to you. Okay, thank you very much, Erna, for the kind introduction, and thank you, uh, thank you and Brie both for uh, including me uh, on this really wonderful lineup of uh, uh, of speakers today. I'm, I'm quite honored to be uh, to be uh, leading it off to uh, to have the keynote spot, um, and uh, I think that you've really assembled a a, a group that will enable um, those following to to. Um, address some of the most relevant issues of genocide and genocide prevention uh, today. I'm going to share my screen and as that sets up, uh, let me sort of lay out my objectives for this talk uh, today. Um, what I, my, my goal is, I, I, I guess I'll take advantage of this keynote spot. Uh, I was invited to address what, uh, what, what, what students, uh, what, what people observing this seminar um, uh, what they might do, what what uh, opportunities for being involved in human rights and, and address, how, how can one address genocide prevention, which is actually a really, I think, a vexing issue. If we think of genocide as sort of one of the worst things that can happen and is happening in our world today, but we're also so powerless, it seems often, uh, to be dealing with something uh, often, you know, fortunately, I suppose on uh, on the other side uh, on the other side of the world, uh, but not always. And I suppose I, I've gotten a little bit in front of myself uh, because I wanted to begin, uh, in addition to thanking uh, uh, thanking uh, my hosts, our hosts. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, I'm speaking. I'm in my my office on Yale uh, at Yale University. Uh, and I, the university acknowledges the indig indigenous peoples and nations uh, that uh, have stewarded the land and waterways through the generations, what is now the state of, of Connecticut. Uh, and I'd like to add my honor and respect uh, that the, uh, to the enduring relationship that exists uh, between these peoples uh, and, and the, this land and, and those waterways, uh, which is also um, a, a, a segue of, of sorts. I think yeah, the, the acknowledgement is meant to stand on its own, but it's also a segue uh, into the recognition that genocide is not always so far away, that it is, uh, if not um, present in, the, in contemporary times, it's present in our history. And uh, and that is I, I I will try to circle around to that by the end of my presentation today, but my objective, as I started to say, was that I wanted to sort of set the table by talking about genocide as a uh, as, as as a concept and thinking of some of the ways that it's been uh, the, some of the ways in which it has been, in which genocide has been conceptualized, sort of created as a concept, but then conceptualized. Over time, and to simplify, I'm going to 
talk about a sort of canonical era, which is roughly the 20th century version of, of how we thought about genocide. And uh, because I couldn't come up with a better name, a post canonical era, uh, I suppose the 21st century, uh, where, where we've started to rethink what we know about genocide. Uh, and then in e with respect to each era, I'd like to talk about the idea of prevention, what we thought we knew about prevention, how prevention did or to sort of show my hand early in the in the game here, how it did not uh, succeed in addressing uh, uh, genocide threats, uh, and then turning that into sort of a a brief conversation at the end, and and hopefully a, a one that can continue about you know, what it means for uh, for us as citizens of the world, what it means for possibilities of action. Um, so without uh, further ado. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I <laughs> jumped into my the, the overview uh, right there. Within each of these two periods, uh, I'll, I'll talk about sort of you know what defines the the notion of genocide at that given moment, give some cases, uh, and then talk about the implications and challenges of uh, for prevention. So uh, to begin with, what I'm calling the canonical genocide era. Um, it, it it starts with uh, the definition of genocide uh, itself. Uh, and that comes from the United Nations Genocide Convention, Article 2. Uh, genocide was a word created by Raphael Lemkin in the uh, 1940s, uh, I think is when it entered the um, uh, entered the Webster's Dictionary. Uh, so it's not something that has, it's not an idea that that people thought of as as a as a thing um, for for centuries, although it certainly existed. It was it was something that people uh, people and nations and societies had practiced for centuries, um, but it never had a name until Lemkin uh, coined this phrase uh, genocide. And then in uh, in once once the United Nations was created, one of the first things they did was take up this issue of of. Uh, uh, defining and and what defining genocide and and uh, establishing a convention to um, uh, prevent and punish that crime. So uh, that's why I start with the with the UN Genocide Convention definition. It uh, because it it's going to kind of define it's the ca canonical definition of genocide. It's what we what we. You know, very literally how we began to think about genocide, we as a, a sort of international uh, uh, community. Uh, and the, the definition is this, uh, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Those acts are killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So that's the core uh, definition. And, and it's got a, there, there are clear references here. It's very obvious uh, what, or for the most part, it's obvious what the, uh, uh, the people who, well, Raphael Lemkin, who coined this phrase, but also the UN committees that turned Raphael Lemkin's ideas into a working uh, definition. They were referring to the Holocaust. Lemkin himself lost many family members uh, in the Holocaust, uh, and all of these crimes were that, that that are listed on the left part of the screen here were crimes that uh, that were committed during the Holocaust. Um, uh, it's it's well worth noting that genocide is not mass murder. Uh, it extends beyond mass murder. There are crimes, the, the B through E are non-mass murder crimes. Um, and uh, so you can have genocide without mass murder, or you can have technically mass murder without uh, genocide. What was important to uh, Lemkin, in, in some sense, uh, was uh, are, are the two almost throwaway words in that def definition as such, which is to say, or a, a group uh, as such, uh, which is which is to say that the what was essentially criminal, what what made genocide worth uh, establish, or the idea of a crime of genocide worth setting aside, setting up as as a crime unto itself, 
was that there was an effort to destroy the group because they were or do, uh, kill people or do any of these other things to people because they were members of a group. But beyond that, it was because the the intent was to destroy the group um, as a group. That identity was the the um, the reason for the the crime, um, and that elimination of at least part of the group, not because of the individuals, but because of of you know, the group attributes. Um, and so, and that again, that defined the Holocaust, and also defined the genocide against Armenians in uh, the late, very, very late Ottoman Empire, uh, beginning in 1915. That was something else that had motivated um, uh, motivated uh, Lemkin's uh, you know, uh, effort to create a, a crime out of this. Finally, it's it, it's often sort of not thrown away, but but. Uh, it, Treated lightly, this this uh, phrase E forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now that happened uh, to some extent during the Holocaust, but if you think about the 1940s, the 1930s, when Lemkin was was uh, forming these ideas, where was that happening? That was happening in the Americas, uh, uh, and in Australia, in the United States, Canada, and Australia in particular, with respect to indigenous peoples. That the in the name of uh, of, of oh, and I use this I have to use this phrase with all the appropriate air quotes a civilizing mission, um, a, 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 a drastically misguided uh, uh, mission. The government, the state, would take children away from uh, parents of, of you know, indigenous uh, or First Nations uh, or Aboriginal um, uh, identity. Uh, send them to be educated in uh, in boarding schools, uh, often Christian um, uh, Christian oriented, uh, and you know, taken away from their families for the sake of removing their identity. Uh, uh, sort of extra, it was almost surgical, trying to extract their identity from these kids, so the next generation would not have that identity. It was very much exactly what Lemkin was was talking about. There's less of a legacy of that uh, of that line in uh, in terms of the way we think about the genocide convention. But one, I would propose that there should be um, more of a, a legacy connecting the genocide uh, convention to those uh, those boarding schools and the various names that they had uh, throughout the world. Um, two other elements, though, came to define the uh, genocide in the 20th century in the sort of uh, popular imagination even in the policy imagination that relate to uh, in particular the roots of this idea in the holocaust in armenia they didn't make it into the formal definition uh, to some extent or at least in a not in any specific sense but because they were defining features of the holocaust and the armenian genocide i think they loomed large in the way people thought about genocide and those are that it that a genocide should involve mass killing uh you know the the definition itself says nothing about numbers it says nothing that uh, there must be some percentage of the group attempted to be, or, or, or in, you know, these 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 acts must be inflicted on some percentage of the group, or there must be a minimum number of people killed, um, or or sterilized, or or um, you know, uh, uh, you know, oper you know, un involuntarily operated upon. There, there's no minimum threshold, and yet the Holocaust was such a, an episode of mass killing that. And, and that and genocide was so associated with with the Holocaust that mass killing was assumed to be part of what people talk about when they talked about genocide. It was also assumed that genocide would be state directed and many of the sort of wildcat definitions of genocide and 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 there are many of these um, uh, tended uh, preferred to focus on on uh, on states. Uh, that 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 uh, or the role of the state in committing genocide because that's what happened in the Holocaust that because that's what happened in Armenia because that's what happened in uh, colonial genocide such as uh, Namibia uh, or, or Southwest Africa the genocide against the Herero people uh, by Germany and in, uh, in the first decade of the 20th century so uh, the I, I don't know if it's necessarily a limit of of imagination um, but it was it it seemed to be consistent with with what if we were trying to talk about you know, prevent the Holocaust from happening again, 
to another people or to uh, or to uh, to Jews. Uh, the the five crimes, uh, five elements of the of the crime committed uh, uh, defined uh, in the convention, plus these two other elements, essentially defined what what genocide would be. Now, I would say that there are implications for prevention here, uh, but as we'll we'll talk about, I'll, I'll talk about in just a, a moment. Uh, it, we can also think of them as sort of misimplications that because the yeah, the Holocaust sort of was the canonical genocide. It defined how we thought about genocide. Uh, and in particular, perhaps because we added uh, the, or people tended to add these two extra elements, the mass killing and the state directed uh, element. We, uh, I, I think there's a, a sort of lost, uh, a lost opportunity or in retrospect, we can see that, that uh, we missed many opportunities to uh, act in response to genocide before us, or even, even to think about it. So, um, the canon of, of genocide after the Holocaust, I think in the in the sort of 20th century era, there were, uh, I think, some clear cases. The Rwandan genocide was certainly a, a, an all five element uh, genocide. Uh, on top of that, the intent to destroy was clearly articulated in mass media. Uh, there were certainly elements of controversy in pinning the phrase genocide on Rwanda, uh, the, the most um, but but it had to do with with the the definition of whether Hutu and Tutsi uh, could really be de uh, uh, defined as uh, different ethnical to use the word of the genocide convention different ethnical uh, groups um, that uh, that came down to a um, uh, a determination in in the judgments that the genocide had occurred in Rwanda the judgments in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda that. Um, that the Hutu leaders believed that Tutsis were a different ethnical group, uh, ethnic group, as we would say now, uh, and that was enough. So it's sort of an eye of eye of the beholder test. I would argue that the mass violence in Guatemala in the the uh, uh, 1980s and Indonesia in the 1960s uh, also met most of the definitions, uh, most of the elements of the genocide uh, convention. Certainly, you know, there's there's no need for all five to be met. That may have been a sort of canonical uh, 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 mis uh, uh, erroneous assumption that goes with part of the canon. Um, but in Guatemala and Indonesia, you have most of those. But what, what's curious, and I'm, I'm I'm foreshadowing a little bit, is that the genocides were largely tolerated uh, at the time by the international uh, community. Uh, there were some other cases that I think are still very clearly genocide, but were a little bit trickier with respect uh, to the uh, to the canon uh, and to the, the canonical definition. Uh, there's Cambodia, where there was clearly mass murder by the state, uh, and yet uh, it was a little bit harder to pick up upon the, the extent to which the protected categories were uh, were targeted within this uh, genocide. It was, uh, I think, ultimately, certainly they were there, but in a way, it was genocide folded into an even larger project of mass murder. The uh, Khmer Rouge regime targeted, uh, for example, uh, Cham Muslims uh, for elimination. They targeted uh, uh, Cambodians of Vietnamese heritage for elimination uh, as, as a group. Uh, they targeted um, uh, they targeted uh, Buddhist monks for elimination, you know, a religious group. So those that that targeting was there, but they also targeted intellectuals. They targeted uh, uh, people with perceived connections to the West, uh, groupings or definitions that were not covered by the Genocide Convention. So for some, it was a little tricky, I think, to make that uh, uh, to recognize that not everything that was that was happening in genocide was uh, sorry happening in Cambodia was a genocide uh, that which is not to say that some murders were okay and some murders were bad all the murder all the killing in Cambodia was was utterly reprehensible um, but in terms of you know, meeting that definition of genocide it, it, it not everything was sort of on equal definitional footing and then there's Bosnia where there's um which unfolded uh, from 1992 to 1995, and I would say multiple instances of, in part, 
genocide, which is, if you'll, you know, you'll recall, the, the definition says in whole or in part, the uh, all five acts were, were undertaken. I'm not actually, at least the, the first four uh, were clearly undertaken against uh, Bosnian Muslims because they were Bosnian Muslims with an intent to destroy uh, that group in certain, uh, in, in certain places. Most notably in Srebrenica, there was an intent to eliminate the the Bosnian Muslim population of Srebrenica, uh, but also in uh, in Vukovar and and uh, in uh, in Garashta. Um, um, I'm not sure. Let me back off on Vukovar for a second. I, that's, uh, but my my Bosnian uh, geography uh, fails me for uh, for a moment there. Um, but uh, in in the so-called areas, the safe areas of eastern Bosnia in particular. There was an effort to uh, to eliminate, but it was it would be hard to draw a connection to the, uh, or a, a plan to eliminate all Bosnians, uh, all Bosnian Muslims um, uh, as a as a whole. Um, indeed, the the genocide against Bosnian Muslims in places like Srebrenica was folded into uh, a. A broader plan of, of so called ethnic cleansing. I'm very glad to see that uh, Gregory Stanton will be speaking later today, uh, debunking the language, or sort of uh, finally sort of uh, uh, establishing why the language of ethnic cleansing is actually unhelpful, uh, because, in part because it covers up, uh, almost apologizes for, or obscures, I suppose is the best word, it obscures where genocide was happening. And in Srebrenica, there is a it, it was a by the definition instance of genocide, but it was in part it, it, uh, sort of operating on the uh, or activating the in part uh, clause within that that definition. So wholly within the definition, but not quite as canonical in the sense that it was not the um, it, it was not the murder of of hundreds of thousands, and it was not uh, directly led by the state, and it wasn't a, uh, there was not the open intent to destroy the entirety of a, of an ethnic group as broadly defined. So I'm not arguing that, that the, what happened in Bosnia wasn't genocide. I think it very clearly was. I'm saying that it was harder for some people to recognize it. Um, and uh, and my goal here is not to say that you know, canonical uh, genocides that fit what people expected to be genocides were the worst ones, and the others were somehow less of one. Uh, they were. Uh, my point is actually that they were all genocides, and the way we interpreted the definition in the light of the Holocaust sort of caused, I think, in the international and in policy responses, uh, an uh, unwarranted tiered uh, response or tiered evaluation to what was and was not uh, was not genocide. Uh, finally, I think there were also genocides in places like Zimbabwe, Bangladesh, and Nigeria um, uh, during, uh, during civil wars or, or wars of liberation uh, in those places. Um, but this questions, there are questions of the scale, the target, and intent that that also uh, at least make the uh, make it harder to see that obscure the extent to which the genocide convention might apply. Even though I, I do believe uh, that in those cases, uh, to some extent, uh, it does. I guess there's no to some extent. I should that, that my, that's my whole point. I believe. Let, let me rephrase that. I believe that in those cases, the genocide convention does uh, does apply. Um, so, um, but but what were the implications for prevention? Though I'm sort of implying, as as you can see, as as perhaps as my uh, the, the arc of what I'm saying uh, would suggest, if you're sort of catching on to that, it's that the way we conceptualized genocide prevented us from uh, from from preventing it, from preventing genocide. We prevented prevention, not uh, not genocide. So. Uh, part of the way that the genocide convention, the lessons of the Holocaust and the writing of the genocide convention, I would say uh, there are kind of three steps during the canonical era. One was that, you know, if we, it was very leadership centered in part, this was the, this was the, the extra uh, conventional um, criterion that the state be involved if and, and and on top of that, the leaders of the state be involved. So the idea was that if there, there were no more. Hitlers that to prevent the the Holocaust, we you know someone should have murdered his uh, Hitler uh, before he rose to power. That's the 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 kind of trope in in uh, in fiction and uh, in historical reimagining. 
uh, that if you prevent a genocidal leader, then you won't have genocide. Um, I suppose the same would apply to the Suhartos of Indonesia, Rios Mont of, Mont of, of uh, Guatemala, Bagasoras of, of Rwanda, although there's less of a trope of you know, what would happen if, if those particular leaders were prevented, uh, were, were prevented from, from rising uh, to power. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that that, that leadership centric view of genocide and genocide prevention is certainly uh, misguided. We also, I think, thought that we would know it when we see it, although we had that very careful definition. I would argue it took till the Rwandan genocide before people really started saying, hey, there's genocide is, uh, can happen. Something like the Holocaust can happen again, even Cambodia with its death toll in the millions, uh, two to three million uh, people killed uh, in Cambodia. Uh, yeah, and and where the, you know if the if the raw numbers was something that kind of had to be clicked before people could start thinking about a genocide, even in that case, uh, the debates about whether or not uh, a, a a a protected group was targeted prevented um, uh, as well as Cold War politics, as we'll see, prevented a reaction uh, to you know, or pre prevent the applica prevented the application of the genocide lens at the time. So after Rwanda, or at the time of Rwanda in the 1990s, there was the sense of maybe we could send peacekeepers would be it would be uh, an, an act of prevention. But as Rwanda itself and also Bosnia revealed, having peacekeepers in the area on the ground was uh, was insufficient. Um, so to evaluate prevention is in this canonical era. Let me summarize with this uh, with the statement that that. Uh, if the genocide convention is the is the convention for the prevention and punishment of genocide, um, it was a total failure uh, in the 20th century. That no, uh, it, 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 it's it's the dog that didn't bark, but but no genocide was was prevented. All of those cases that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, they happened. They happened right underneath our noses, um, and nothing was done about them uh, before. Or during, and only in the 1990s was there an effort to punish uh, genocide. Uh, initially, in, in the Bosnian and Rwanda cases, a little bit later in the Cambodia case. Uh, and I think that uh, the reason was that although we could recognize Hitler, we were looking for Hitler, and so we missed Suharto as a genocidal mastermind. We missed Rios Mont as a genocidal mastermind. We missed Bagasora as a genocidal mastermind, at least uh, in advance. It also may be that the mastermind model was inappropriate. Um, that we, we failed to recognize the genocidal masterminds because genocides were often planned by committee, uh, that they they represented a, a political power grab uh, in, in those, uh, the, the Indonesian, Rwandan, and uh, Guatemalan cases that uh, that obscures the that they weren't uh, born on uh, you know an eliminationist fascist um, uh, you know, fascist for fascism sakes uh, ideology. They were born on a project of seizing power, uh, and uh, and we failed to recognize that. I think more importantly, the Cold War lens enabled mass slaughter, most obviously in Indonesia, where. One way of looking at the, uh, the, the violence against, uh, against the various populations in Indonesia, but including uh, um, in, uh, Chinese, uh, Indonesians of Chinese descent or Chinese nationality, um, people living in Indonesia who claimed Chinese nationality, that they were, uh, their um, uh, mass slaughter of them was, was tolerated by the US, uh, in, in fact, enabled by the United States in particular, uh, because it was exactly what the ideal American policy at the time, in in their own terms, um, uh, towards Southeast Asian communist uprisings was. What happened in Indonesia was genocide. What happened in 1965 and 1966, uh, in particular, and it was also exactly what the U.S. wanted to ha wished would happen elsewhere in uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, that the uh, the the U.S. at the time saw it as the successful elimination of a communist threat. Um, it did not matter to the U.S. that it was genocide because it was a Cold War. Uh, it was viewed through the Cold War lens and a defeat of of communism. 
Finally, this point about peacekeepers, I've, I, I already mentioned that you know, we had peacekeepers, that we, the, the world had peacekeepers on the ground by the 1990s. Uh, peacekeepers were seen as a, as a potential tool to prevent genocide, but not one that was con like given the mandate to actually do anything. So in Rwanda, peacekeepers were withdrawn as, uh, as uh, genocide unfolded. In, uh, in Bosnia and in Srebrenica in particular, uh, peacekeepers were were uh, uh, you know, seen sharing drinks with the perpetrators of genocide, Rako Mladic uh, and uh, the Bosnian Serb uh, army, uh, as they uh, as the peacekeepers helped load the women and children on the bus, uh, the buses to uh, take them away, so that the uh, peacekeepers didn't appreciate this at the time, but so that the men uh, who remained could be uh, slaughtered, uh, killed en masse. So peacekeepers without any mandate, without any expectation, without any, uh, there may have been an expectation that simply their presence could prevent genocide, but with in the, in the 90s during this canonical era, um, uh, there was no real thought to how that could be operationalized. So let me, let, let me argue that that after the 1990s, we sort of we, we've entered a what I'm calling the uh, somewhat unoriginally the post canonical uh, era of, of genocide uh, in which it, we've had to rethink many of these uh, elements. And, and part of this is entirely appropriate uh, because of the blinders that thinking of genocide in the in the canonical terms that I've described for the past 20 minutes or so, the blinders that those those put on us. Um, the elements of post canonical genocide uh, are, in, in, are, are threefold, I think. First of all, there's a retreat of the state. Uh, the state is no longer centered in definitions or, or expectations about what happens in genocide. Rather, uh, genocides in the 21st century have been committed by proxies of the state or even by non state actors like ISIS. Um, of course, ISIS or da uh, 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 Daesh uh, are both uh, presume you know, they're, they're, they're a self-styled self -styled state, um, but they're not recognized states uh, or they do not comprise of a, a state recognized uh, externally. Um, there's also uh, mobilization is different uh, in part because of the reliance on proxies. Uh, because it, it, it's not state mobilized where state led propaganda uh, campaigns can be identified and as, as, as how genocide unfolds. Um, instead, in the era of, of smartphones or, 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 or web 2.0 and social media, uh, it's made possible individuated propaganda that, that uh, 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 direct messaging, sometimes literal direct messaging to individuals to either uh, participate in in uh, genocide in some ways, participate in killing uh, in some element of that process, or just as importantly, I would argue, in demobilizing, telling people to stand aside and let other people uh, uh, do the killing, and that and, and sort of desensitizing uh, the the uh, revulsion, the social and and civil revulsion as well as the sort of emotional and physical revulsion that people have towards killing in their uh, in their community. The post -canonic, post canonical era is also defined by a battle over sovereignty. And I would simply frame this as a conflict between the Bandung principles uh, and the responsibility to protect the Bandung principles are uh, essentially the principles of the non-aligned movement uh, articulated in, ba in Bandung, Indonesia, I think in 1956. Uh, and there it's the idea that for, um, uh, for the so-called third world at the time, uh, that sovereignty was the most essential uh, element of political survival in the international stage. And that the thing that was owed to uh, Newer, poorer, weaker, uh, but but developing and uh, uh, states, uh, states that were every bit as members of the international community as the superpowers. That what was owed to them was total respect for their sovereignty, the right to do to manage their own affairs uh, in their entirety. Now, this to some extent was honored in the breach. Uh, there was lots of of meddling, but meddling was in the first instance almost always defined as pro-state meddling um, and uh, um, 
the 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 there were many proxy wars throughout the world, but everything had to be couched within a you know, international action in in the in the so-called third world was always couched within respect for sovereignty uh, principles. And Indonesia and Guatemala, uh, locations of genocide, sort of uh, inhabited that uh, uh, that principle. Following the failures of, in particular, the UN and its peacekeepers in Rwanda and uh, and and Bosnia. I'd argue it's actually a failure of the UN and, and the Security Councils that uh, that uh, use peacekeepers as, as scapegoats. But either way, the the doctrine of responsibility to protect was uh, was uh, established, proposed, established, accepted by the UN General Assembly, and slowly integrated into Security Council thinking on genocide cases. And responsibility, the responsibility to protect is an explicit uh, rejection, I would argue, of what I've just sort of termed the bandung uh, principles of, of uh, sovereignty above all. Responsibility to protect says that sovereignty is a not just negatively defined, that is the negative definition of sovereignty is you can't interfere in my realm. The positive definition of sovereignty is you have a responsibility towards the people in your realm. And so, and that responsibility includes the responsibility to protect those people from harm, according to the responsibility to protect. Furthermore, according to the responsibility to protect doctrine, if a state fails to protect the people uh, over which it has uh, authority in its jurisdiction, in its, in its territory, then the international community uh, assumes the responsibility to protect those people. So, for example, if the responsibility to protect had been the guiding principle in Rwanda, it would be fall to the the interim regime in Rwanda after President Javier Mana had been killed in a plane crash, uh, his plane shot down out of the sky on April 6, 1994, uh, leading to the formation of an interim government. It was the responsibility of that interim government to protect the lives of Hutu and Tutsi uh, civilians. When it became clear that the government was failing to protect the lives of Tutsi civilians, the international community would have a responsibility, beginning with the peacekeepers on the ground, to protect those uh, civilians. Because that lens did not exist in 1994, uh, responsibility to protect was adopted by the General Assembly in 2005. Uh, it's only you know, only proposed as a, 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 a as a by a commission as a as a concept as an idea in 2001 uh, because it didn't exist in 1994. Instead, peacekeepers retreated from the position where they could have been protecting uh, Rwandan civilians. Anyways, that battle will defines uh, we see it in operation unresolved in one one direction or the other by and large uh over the uh, uh over the past 20 years although uh, just to foreshadow again uh if it's a tussle between bandung and r2p uh all too often i think we see bandung winning um so the let me describe give some examples of of genocide in the post canonical uh era as i mentioned uh the, the state uses uh, proxies rather than or to the extent the state is involved they they subcontract out the actual execution of genocide to their proxies uh the mobilization that happens typically takes place at a local basis rather than through uh mass rallies and uh and national uh, sort of directives uh, there's sometimes even a quasi democratic logic to it the targeted groups are often minorities as has typically been the case for uh genocide but there uh, is uh is deemed justifiable in the name of democracy that uh that th those um uh, those who are challenging them uh, or those who are targeted for elimination um, are unable to protect themselves through dem democratic principles. And that since those democratic principles or institutions exist in a given uh, country, uh, then the outcome targeting is by the logic of those perpetuating the genocide or, or uh, uh, that that it, it's defensible again defensible again that's not my logic that's not the way we should think about it but that is part of the internal logic of, of genocide and there's also again uh, an increased reliance I think learning from from what uh, Serbs and Croats did to one another and tried to do with with Bosnians uh, in the Balkans in the early 90s there's a logic of um, 
if if mass violence can be framed as ethnic cleansing, then it it, it shouldn't be conceived of as as genocide. And again, I'll leave it to Professor Stanton to uh, to rebut the, that claim as it absolutely should be uh, should be done uh, later today. Uh, the quintessential cases are Darfur and Rohingya, uh, Darfur and Sudan, Rohingya, uh, the Rohingya in uh, in in Myanmar. Uh, in both cases, I think we see all four of those elements uh, in place. Uh, and I want to get to some of the prevention issues while I still have time, so I'm going to fast forward uh, slightly. Uh, but let me add the other uh, that I think there are other exceptions here um, that that are again breaking apart, breaking away. You, we see the breaking away from the canonical lens of what genocide consists of the genocide against the Yazidis in which there's a non-state perpetrator, even though the intent is more, I say cleaner, I, I, what I really mean is more clearly articulated uh, in that case, the intent to destroy the Yazidi as a, as a group. Uh, in places like Cameroon, Burundi, and China, in China I'm referring to uh, the, uh, uh, the genocide against the Uyghurs in, uh, in East uh, Turkestan, uh, the state is the perpetrator, the framing is not only sort of in the name of democracy, but also as an anti-terror uh, action. Um, and there's an effort to sort of uh, have a, what I'm calling a bounded impact, rather than engage in mass murder as uh, various actors did, and uh, to to kill them all as the the approach was in those canonical genocides of the 20th century. Uh, there is a recognition that any cl clear statement to that effect uh, would be would draw punishment, would draw some sort of international reaction. So instead, both by using um, using proxies or even in these cases where the state is more directly the perpetrator, uh, there's still an effort to obscure the extent to which genocide is being committed by by uh, casting it as ethnic uh, ethnic cleansing or some, or or even anti-terror uh, violence. So what are the implications in prevention though, now that we're conceiving that we can conceive of genocide more broadly. Um, one is uh, is the you know, to look at um, the responsibility to protect to recognize that the Bandung principle of sovereignty before all is that may actually be part of the problem. Another is that uh, there is room for a civil society movement to speak out against genocide if non state actors are increasingly involved in genocide, the non-state actors must, must be increasingly involved in, um, in responding to genocide and trying to prevent genocide. So we can think of grassroots movements like STAND, or um, uh, which is students taking action now against Darfur, or well, Save Darfur, a larger, uh, uh, non, not necessarily student-based group, that both of which emerged in the first decade of the 21st century, as well as professional civil society, groups like the Global Co Coalition for the Responsibility to Protect, or the Auschwitz Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, which, uh, which try to mobilize uh, um, sort of elites and uh, create a, um, a high-level network of opponents to uh, people ready to try to prevent genocide. Um, and then finally, recognizing the role of, of social media, there's there's a effort in preventing genocide in the post canonical era involves limiting the reach of, of social media, both in terms of content moderation, trying to uh, to uh, deplatform the, you know, the literal incitement to genocide. Uh, to, to prevent that those messages from being propagated, but also increasingly a recognition that there needs to be some sort of uh, what, what's, what's sometimes called context moderation, which is to say that that uh, it, you know the 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 necessary interference with what is being posted on social media can't be limited simply to uh, to certain bad words. Um, but really, there needs to be an awareness of how words are being used, how images are being used, perhaps to uh, to demonize, dehumanize, and uh, otherwise uh, persecute uh, of uh, targeted groups um, before their actual before you know, moments of actual incitement take place. Um, let me summarize, though, prevention in at least two decades into my somewhat arbitrary, maybe two and a half decades, my somewhat arbitrary post-canonical uh, era uh, um, uh, 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 time frame, I would say prevention is still mostly a failure. There are actually several moments in which R2P has had 
had some success. It, it, it's taken root in UN policy uh, to in, in several instances, uh, particularly in sort of upstream uh, involvement, upstream interactions. Uh, when uh, you know, for example, uh, there was a um, you know, a conflict in uh, a communal conflict, I believe, it was in Uz Uzbekistan that. Uh, that the United Nations Office of the uh, Responsibility to Protect and the Office of Genocide Prevention were able to sort of facilitate behind the scenes negotiations that prevented um, prevented a much larger, more ethnically based uh, spate of violence uh, from happening. So uh, I would say in, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, where the Security Council uh, authorized um, robust action on behalf of uh, one party to a conflict that they succeeded in preventing um, what could have been ethnic based urban violence um, and probably genocide from from breaking out in uh, in 2011. But by and large, if if the uh, the essential doctrinal battle is is R2P versus Bandung, R R2P versus sovereignty, sovereignty is winning. When we look at at uh, the Rohingya, when we look at um, or, or actions against Myanmar in, in, in efforts to protect the Rohingya, we look at actions in Syria, we look at uh, the efforts to uh, shed sort of international light and attention on uh, the Uyghurs in Western China. Um, what we see each time is the claim of sovereignty is still, um, if you'll forgive the phrase, the trump card. Um, uh, the that uh, the G card, perhaps uh, that the claim of sovereignty is uh, is able to prevent, at least through the existing rules of the United Nations, is able to prevent the application of responsibility to protect principles where they are most needed. We've also seen limitations of civil society. Well, the uh, the professional version, professional civil society that I mentioned, those those organizations are up and running and doing a, a really a wonderful job. Their reach is is limited, and it's limited often to behind the scenes work that's 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 less appreciated. What we the the momentum that Stand and Save Darfur and uh, other organizations had in the mid two thousands, the decade of the two thousands. Uh, has largely been lost, and there is no, at least in the U.S. and I think in, in Europe as well, um, uh, uh, and, and 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 sort of in a, in a pan-Asian or pan-African sense, uh, there aren't robust grassroots movements along the lines of what Stand um, and, and Save Darfur promised to be. Even Amnesty International and and Human Rights Watch, I think, are. Yeah, the, the sort of preeminent uh, flagships of, uh, of hum global human rights um, are really less focused on genocide prevention and less able to, to uh, catalyze movements on, uh, in, in the terms of preventing genocide. Finally, with respect to social media, we found that it time and time again in situations like in, in Myanmar or recently in Ethiopia, that the amplification outpaces moderation. Uh, that that the the logic of so for, of social media, uh, according to the platforms themselves, is that they make money when more people use them and turn to them, and that happens when outrageous content is amplified, not when it was taken when it's taken off. So, uh, social media companies have not stepped up to uh, to the game, uh, stepped up to the plate, I, I guess. To, complete the metaphor, uh, in terms of taking their responsibility seriously in moderating uh, incendiary conflict. Uh, they're often too late because they, and, and, and then somewhat unwilling to do so, because when that incendiary conflict um, the content uh, comes across their screen, often it's making them a lot of money, um, or the initial process by which it blew up, as it were, made them a lot of money. And, and while they're willing to take it off after the fact, they need to be much, much better at detecting that type of conflict uh, content uh, in advance. So finally, uh, let me ask uh, uh, what is to be done? Uh, is prevention in, in this, the light of all of this uh, possible? Um, I think the best way to think about it is that there are really three realms of prevention. One is that global governance realm. Uh, with uh, 
uh, which essentially I think revolves revolves around trying to implement R2P or try to get R2P give R2P the upper hand over the Bandung principles in cases of of genocide. Uh, in order to do this, we need to, really two things. One is Security Council reform, perhaps some way that would punish what I call veto abuse when the veto is used in mass atrocity cases. Perhaps better yet would be simply uh, uh, some way to remove the veto in mass atrocity cases. It may also entail expanding the Security Council, expanding the veto, giving more countries the veto, um, and then instituting rules like this as a sort of condition for, for giving more countries uh, something like a, a veto. Um, I think there's also a need for something with uh, a body with magistrate like powers. You know, magistrates issue uh, issue warrants or um, they, they can define a case where or identify where a crime is likely to be occurring or likely to have occurred and authorize further action. Uh, it's meant to be apolitical in uh, in the systems in where it's used. It's impossible to create an international institution that is apolitical. Um, but then again, I think we still have to try. And even in the Security Council reform that I've envisioned, it depends upon the definition of a mass atrocity case. We need a magistrate-like institution that is empowered to make that uh, that definition. Um, I can talk about regional organizations as well. Uh, the African Union has uh, come closer to establishing that magistrate, a magistrate-like uh, body, uh, but it, it remains uh, sort of incompletely developed. A second realm is corporate governance, uh, and this we can think of this as particularly as pertaining to social media companies, but I think it pertains to other companies as well, like companies that, that for example, buy cotton that may or may not have been produced by uh, Uyghur slave labor. Um, to use a very specific example, I think uh, corporations need to have a duty of care when they enter a market that they they know they're going into a market uh, with the, the, the they're aware of the consequences of them doing so uh, that they become cognizant of their potential complicity with bad behavior by actors in uh, in, in the states in which they are acting uh, that they have an exit or a retreat plan for when, uh, when their participation in a market uh, becomes complicit with crimes, uh, with genocide or other crimes, uh, and that they're able to cooperate with global governance mechanisms, in particular, the ICC or the International Court of Justice or other uh, conflict, um, uh, uh, other uh, judicial mechanisms like that, and, and the Security Council, for that matter, it doesn't need to be strictly uh, uh, judicial, uh, when mass atrocity is, uh, seems to be at issue. None of that has anything to do, or little of this has anything to do with what, what you can do, what, what, uh, what, and, and that's the realm of civil society. So let me finish on that note. Having reconceptualized genocide from our canonical view into the, the, the broader, uh, a wider understanding of what genocide entails and really uh, 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 appreciating the complications, uh, the more complicated, more complex story that uh, the genocide in the 21st century typically involves. Uh, let me propose uh, the following. I think there needs to be a global anti-fascism effort predicated on a belief in the universality of rights. Fascism I'm using in this sense as uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, Genocide requires an eliminationist tech uh, uh, perspective, an eliminationist philosophy. Fascism is the belief that uh, the political community uh, is uh, is narrow. It belongs to some, but not others. And so, anti-fascism is addressing that, addressing what what becomes genocide one one step earlier. Fascism be, uh, turns into genocide when the call there's a call to use violence or other versions of, of methods described in the original definition of genocide to uh, uh, to target the existence of a group. Um, but it's predicated on the fundamental fascist group, that, a fascist belief that that group does not belong. Instead, if we believe in the universality of rights, um, uh, right and fundamentally the right to participate in the political community, uh, then we have a baseline uh, uh, that we can use to oppose uh, fascist efforts that uh, turn genocidal. To do this, we need to rebuild some of those networks like um, 
uh, like, um, like like stand or save Darfur and expand upon them. Um, and, and we need to sort of uh, take seriously the, what uh, recognize what, what we can do uh, as individuals, uh, as students, in particular university communities, I think are uh, ripe places for for these networks uh, to, uh, uh, to to construct themselves. They can be built in the short term as students cycle through, but they can still be institutionalized sort of in the way that political parties are institutionalized within a given national context. The nice thing about campuses, there are universities throughout the whole world. Uh, and there's, I think, a ready, uh, it, it's, it's not too difficult to establish networks, or it should not be too difficult to establish networks, not only between universities in Connecticut or the Northeast or the US, but between Connecticut universities and African universities, between New York universities and European universities, Asian universities and Maryland universities, uh, et cetera. Um, these networks can put pressures on states, they can put pressures on on corporations um, uh, to uh, to act. There's very little that civil society can do on its own, but there's very little that states or corporations will do uh, for their part without that pressure from below. Now, at this point, I think I've, I've spoken about 10 minutes longer than I ever intended to, and for that, I apologize, uh, but I would love to uh, uh, accept any questions that might have arisen over the course of my uh, of my presentation. The very last point I wanted to make, I forgot I'd, I'd, I'd added this because I think it's terribly important, is that the, the, the effort I'm describing, the, the um, uh, position I'm describing, perspective I'm describing is about cons concern primarily abroad but they need to be paired with principles at home. So the same principles, believing in universality of rights uh, has to be applied uh, at home, whether we're talking about immigrant communities, uh, racial, religious, ethnic, linguistic communities. Um, we have to, uh, for, for the sake of credibility alone, we have to build our, uh, uh, build that belief and build networks uh, based on those universality of rights principles at home um, uh, at the same time, not before, but at the same time that we develop and our, our, our understanding and our concern and our program of action abroad. So thank you very much. And, and if there's a way that I can uh, address some questions at this point, I'd be delighted to do so. Yes, we actually got some questions in on our Q&A. So I'll ask the first one that came in. Um, do you find that each genocidal situation is compared to the Holocaust is it much in severity? And then the second question is, how can we make the distinction between genocide and crimes against humanity? Okay, uh, yeah, so I think that the, the severity question is, is part of the, um, it, it, it's with all due respect, I think it's the wrong question. Um, so I think that's exactly the question we should not be trying to answer, uh, that the severity of genocides misleads us into thinking there's a hierarchy of genocides, that the, you know, what's, what's fundamentally at issue in genocides is, is there an effort to destroy a group in whole or in part, uh, an intentional effort? And um, it doesn't so much matter whether that effort is half-hearted or, uh, or, or fully implemented and mechanized. Um, that effort needs to be recognized as genocide and action needs to be taken to to prevent it. Uh, so in that respect, you know, say the if you know, I, I believe that uh, the, the that uh, Serbia was trying to commit genocide against Kosovars in 1999. It's trying to eliminate the Kosovar population in uh, within Kos the, the, the sorry the Muslim population in um, in Kosovo. Um, whether by driving them out or by by killing them or, or doing both in the end um you know there's there's i think the the, the sort of final estimates that 8000 kosovars were killed at, at the hands of the serbian forces um that's clearly a bad thing um it's nowhere near the 1 million or 2 million or 6 million that you can you know, attach those to the to different genocides that those, those numbers to different genocides I've already mentioned. It's nowhere near that level. Um, and perhaps it's 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 less severe in that respect, but it is every bit as much of a genocide to which we need to respond. And again, um, 
you know, the, uh, with uh, as uh, I'm, I'm delighted that that Professor Stanton will be speaking about the the uh, potential uh, the, the need to to stop having our vision obscured by the this the the label of ethnic cleansing. Uh, because that sometimes uh, obstructs our way, or, uh, obstructs our ability to appreciate what that that genocide, you know, genocidal effort is in fact genocide. Crimes against humanity has a a, a legal definition. Uh, the most uh, and it includes a, a host of different sort of sub crimes. Um, the most relevant of which is persecution, um, and that involves a widespread and systematic attack against a civilian population. Um, Essentially, what that means uh, in, in uh, this isn't a legal uh, opinion, but a, a sort of a, a shorthand. What that means, it's genocide without having to prove the intent. And I think it's a very, uh, a very useful. Uh, you know, the, it, it gives a reminder that uh, that um, what's happening in in a, in a country where we may not be able to recognize intent. Uh, but still involves mass killing or even mass measures to prevent births, that, uh, that, there, that there's still a widespread systematic attack, that people are being attacked for, for who they are, um, uh, and, and, that, that, and, and facing death, um, and communities are facing uh, extinction, even if it's not intended for their extinction, that all of those reasons, all of those things are still bad. Um, and, and very typically, you know, the, the crime of persecution is as a crime against humanity is very easy to uh, to recognize in those cases. Um, you, you, to to that end, there's almost a boutique element of genocide, which is to say, you know, is there this additional um, intent to destroy uh, component that that um, that flavors the widespread and systematic uh, attack? Um, and it is both. Uh, every bit as bad, um, and 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 and, but no more, uh, because it because you know of the you know the severity of the level of the crimes we're talking about is genocide, uh, and, and and worse because there's this effort to intentional effort to eliminate a group, which is you know an effort to deprive both, but both what that means for those targeted for those being being persecuted that they're they're being uh, you know. Uh, threatened with death or, or facing death simply because of, of how they identify and what it means for the global community, that the, 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 the subtraction, the effort to subtract a, uh, a sub-community from the global community uh, is something that can never be replaced uh, and, and, and would be permanently lost. Thank you so much for answering. I think you really um, end up concisely great um, straight to the point answer those questions and thank you for your presentation it was a great way to start off our day and give an overview of kind of what genocide is of the genocide occurring uh, within the era so i'm glad to have you join we have come to the end of our um, discussion um, and i hope everyone else can join on later on for the other various um, panels we have thank you again dr simon um, for joining us Thank you. It's it, it's been my pleasure, and I look forward to uh, to presentations throughout the day. Thank you. All right. immediately decided that I should learn more about the law because I'm an international lawyer. That's my field. I'm also, I've qualified as a lawyer. I've practiced law before the courts, but for, for most of the last three decades, I've been essentially a legal academic teaching at various universities in different parts of the world. And my specialty is international law, the international law of human rights. I went looking for the books and I discovered that actually Virtually nothing had been written about the legal aspects of genocide since the 1950s. Um, when a couple of monographs were published, there were a few journal articles over the years, but it wasn't just me that had ignored the subject that had generally been ignored by international human rights lawyers. And that most of the discussion about genocide had been taken up by, by historians, social scientists, uh, people from the social sciences and humanities, and that was where most of the publishing was. So I got the literature and started reading it. And what I found in in frequently was people would write about 
about genocide and they would say, well, my definition of genocide is this, or my definition of genocide is that. And there was a whole range of different definitions being proposed. And of course, that wasn't my reflex as a lawyer. Uh, the lawyer wants to know what the law is, not what someone would like it to be or thinks it should be. Um, it's not unlike uh, other words that we encounter in human rights law, like think of torture, think of rape. These are words that have a generic, that have a colloquial meaning. And I dare say, if I asked everybody in the room, uh, the virtual room to define torture, we would get 20 different definitions, slightly different. And if I asked you to define rape, we would get 20 different definitions. But of course, a lawyer wants to see what the legal definition is, where it's written down. And so I started doing that. And of course, uh, that took me very quickly to this text. And I'm just, there we go. My next slide, this is the Genocide Convention of 1948. And when we're talking about the law of genocide, that's, that's what it's all about, essentially. I don't wanna oversimplify it uh, too much, but it's most of our quarrels, our debates about what genocide is and how the term can be used comes back to Article 2 of this convention, which was adopted in 1948, which was a result of complicated negotiations and which reflects compromises. And which, unlike other definitions of crimes in international law, has not evolved since 1948. So those of you who know a little bit about, for example, the International Criminal Court or the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda will know that they have different definitions of war crimes, different definitions of crimes against humanity. The definition's a little different sometimes a lot different from one court to another, and of course, quite different from the original formulation of those definitions back in 1945 at Nuremberg. But genocide has this quite unique feature of never changing. Brianna, you're telling me the slide didn't change on the PowerPoint, no? Yes, I, I somehow don't see it either, unfortunately. Are you in presentation view on your side? Um, I don't know. I don't um, know. Perhaps instead of sharing, um, if you click share and share the screen rather than PowerPoint, maybe it would be easier for everyone to see everything. My apologies, everyone, while we figure this out. We did figure it out, but we I didn't. know I thought so, too. <laughs> Is it there? I still see the main slide, the crime of genocide under international law. OK. Now, let me. There. You see the definition? No, unfortunately not. I mean, if if the slides aren't um, crucial to the presentation and used more as a as a guideline for your um, knowledge and presentation, I think we would be fine just listening, if that's easiest for everyone. Okay, I don't normally use PowerPoint, and I find okay. it to be convenient um, mm -hmm. when I have quotations. I don't do okay. a lot of point form things, um, and I wanted to show you this definition. Well, you can look it up, and you can Google it, and you can find it easily. It's Article Two of the Genocide Convention. And like uh, other definitions of international crimes, it has a, a typical structure to it. It begins with what we call a chapeau or an introductory paragraph or what we sometimes call a contextual element. And then it's followed by a series of, of paragraphs or sub paragraphs where specific acts are listed. So the specific acts that are listed under genocide are first of all killing, and then causing serious bodily or mental harm, and then the directly inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about the physical destruction of the group, imposing measures to prevent births, and for forcibly transferring children. So to fit within the confines of that definition, one of those five acts has to be identified. But it's not enough to do that, and often people applying this um, think that they've kind of solved the problem by identifying one of those acts as being an act 
uh, as, as being perpetrated, but killing members of the group, I have to say that there are members of ethnic groups and racial groups that are killed every single day in many countries of the world, including the United States. And we're, I'm saying this while we're aware that a, a trial is underway and we're hopefully going to have a verdict soon of a, of a black man who was killed in Minneapolis. That's killing members of the group. But we're not calling it genocide. We're not calling the George Floyd killing genocide. And that's because the introductory paragraph says that it has to be committed, and I quote, with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. So it's not nearly enough to find one of those acts. That's really the easy part of identifying genocide under the international law. Hard part is determining that the act was committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part the group. And it has to be a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. I should add that the way this has been applied, it wasn't clear to me 28 years ago when I went to Rwanda that this was an established part of the definition. Because 28 years ago, we had very little, virtually no judicial interpretation by courts of the definition because that, that crime of genocide in the definition under international law had, had been largely dormant since it was adopted in 1948, along with pretty much everything else in international criminal law, which was a almost a non-existent subject until the 1990s and has grown now into being a, a hugely important feature of international law. Um, and, and one where there are courses, there are probably courses on this at UConn, there are now at most universities. When I studied law in the 1980s, it didn't exist as a subject. So what has happened since the 1990s is that this definition has been interpreted by important international courts, initially by the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, and then by the real, the, 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 the mother of all courts, the, the International Court of Justice, which is the primary, the principal legal organ of the United Nations. And what has emerged from that is a pretty clear vision of this definition that before the word intent in that phrase with intent to destroy, I'm sorry, before the word destroy, uh, we have to add the word physically. In other words, it involves the physical destruction of the group. And that's the conclusion that one reaches from the courts. I was interviewed a few weeks ago by a journalist from uh, Voice of America, who was doing a story about uh, China and the Uyghur situation. And at one point she said to me, she said, you know, some of your colleagues think you're, you have a very conservative approach, a very strict approach to the definition of genocide. You know, I, I'm, I'm here in a, in a university environment speaking as a scholar, not as, a, not as a, an advocate. Um, I'm trying to teach and trying to tell you what I think the law is. So it's not what I'd like the law to be. Uh, it's what the law is and what the law is, is the text and how it's been interpreted by the courts. So I'm not arguing for an interpretation. And I think that as a scholar, I try very much to uh, keep a degree of, of objectivity and neutrality in interpreting what the law is. Uh, if you came to my law school or any law school and your lecturer told you at the beginning of a class, I know you're here to study contract law, but I'm not going to teach you contract law because I don't agree with it. I'm going to teach you what I think it should be. You would probably go in to see the dean and ask for a transfer because you're there to study what the law is, not what the professor would like it to be. Now, I probably contributed to a little bit of confusion about what, what my view is because as a sideline to being an academic, I've done a little bit of litigation and I've uh, acted for countries uh, in international courts on the subject. I think four times. Twice I argued for a strict interpretation of the crime of genocide and twice I argued for a large interpretation of the crime of genocide. Uh, as a lawyer, I was arguing for my client. And people see that and they hear you and they say, so that's his opinion. It, it's never the lawyer's opinion. The lawyer is there defending the client, presenting the views of the client 
And that's why if you went to try and figure out what my views are, by what I've argued in court, if you look at all of them, you'd be very confused because I've argued both sides. Um, I argued for Lithuanian human rights five years ago for a broad approach to the interpretation of genocide, include political groups in the list of, of groups. Uh, I've argued for, uh, in, in the case of Myanmar, Gambia versus Myanmar, not for a broad or a narrow interpretation, but really that the court should stick to the interpretation that it has adopted previously. So, I mean, this is normal. Every lawyer is like that, frankly. So if you go in, you can't determine the lawyer's personal views from what they say in court um, because they're there acting on behalf of a client. But what I'm trying to do here is to present this law to you as uh, objectively as I can. I think that in trying to understand the crime of genocide, it's very important to see it as being uh, as being located on a spectrum, a spectrum of international crimes. At the International Criminal Court, uh, we have the possibility of prosecuting genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. To a large extent, that's our spectrum. Those crimes all sit there on the spectrum and uh, it's not uh, infrequent that one particular act can be characterized by two or three or maybe even four of those crimes, and it will fit into all four of them. They lie on a kind of a, of a spectrum. Um, there's nothing unusual about that. Criminal law is like that. Uh, Derek Chauvin is on trial for three different crimes. I can't remember the exact definitions. I think one is second degree murder, then there's third degree homicide and manslaughter. In many cases, there are three different, there's a spectrum. The criminal law of Minnesota has a spectrum of crimes. There are probably some crimes that theoretically he could have been charged with that are also on that spectrum. He wasn't charged with first degree murder, with, with deliberate, planned, intentional murder. That also is on the spectrum. Um, and he wasn't tried, I don't think, with assault, which lies probably at the far end of the spectrum and doesn't require any evidence. He probably also assaulted George Floyd as well as everything else. But, but that's a spectrum. So we have to look at what we're doing when we confront a situation where there's a, an allegation or a charge of genocide is we're looking to see where it fits on the spectrum. And it's almost inevitable that if something doesn't fit on the spectrum under genocide, that it fits somewhere else. Um, generally as a crime against humanity, quite possibly as a war crime, although a war crime requires that there be a war and with genocide and crimes against humanity, we have no requirement that there's a session on the uh, on the program today uh, called ethnic cleansing as a um, um, the denial of genocide. I forget the exact term, but you'll have the program. And I, I feel compelled to speak to it because it's something consistent with that type of formulation. I don't know exactly what's going to be said there, and I can't preempt it, but. Ethnic cleansing is something that definitely sits on that spectrum. It, it's, not a, it's not a crime that has a strict legal definition, and you won't find it listed as such in the uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court or in another treaty. But it's been recognized by the International Court of Justice as being a, a legal reality, and it's been recognized also in resolutions of the General Assembly and so on. So it's we're talking about now there ethnic cleansing. Here's here's what the International Court of Justice said. I'm changing my slides and I've forgotten you're not seeing them. So I'm going to read you very briefly the paragraph. It's paragraph 190 of the judgment on the genocide case of the International Court of Justice of 2007. And it says that ethnic cleansing is in practice used to, to mean, and they quote, 
rendering an area ethnically homogeneous by using force or intimidation to remove persons of given groups from the area. And the court says neither the intent as a matter of policy to render an area ethnically homogeneous, nor the operations that may be carried out to implement such policy can as such be designated as genocide. The intent that characterizes genocide is to destroy in whole or in part a particular group. And deportation or placement of them either by force is not necessarily not necessarily equivalent to destruction of the group, nor is such destruction an automatic consequence of the displacement. So what the court is doing there is pointing to another reality on the spectrum, which is forced displacement. Whatever we choose to call it, there is a crime called deportation. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is preparing a case of for deportation in the case of Myanmar, Myanmar, Bangladesh, as it's known. There are other cases where we find a strong case can be made out for deportation, and it's distinct from destruction. And that's the point the International Court of Justice is making. And it's a reality that we will have certain circumstances that are better described as being deportation. We could say more colloquially expulsion. And if you don't like the term ethnic cleansing, call it something else. But the reality is it's distinct from destruction. This is a, an old point, by the way. I think I can trace it back to the first judgment on that definition of genocide that I've referred to. And that's the judgment of the District Court of Jerusalem in the famous Eichmann trial in 1961. And the Eichmann trial was dealing with a spectrum of crimes, genocide, but other crimes as well, including crimes against humanity, charged against Eichmann, who was the notorious Nazi that they had taken, uh, kidnapped uh, essentially in, in Argentina and taken to Israel for this famous trial. And until the 1990s, this was the main trial based on the genocide convention that had taken place. And there the court, uh, dismissed the charge of genocide against Eichmann for the acts of the Nazi regime prior to 1941. He was charged with committing genocide from the 1930s. And they said, no, we can't call it genocide because the Jews were being driven out. They, they were being driven out at the time, but there was there's not enough evidence that they were intending to keep them in Germany and exterminate them. And so they acquitted Eichmann on the genocide charge for that period prior to 1941. It was a reality. There was a point where Jews could no longer leave. My family experienced this. My, my great uncles, my father's uncles, were living in Berlin in the 1930s. And they were victims of persecution, anti-Semitic persecution. And at one point in 1938, when you had the Kristallnacht, they realized they had to get out. They could get out. And, and they saved, they, they, they were spared, they saved their lives because they were able to flee because it was still possible to, to leave Germany. In 1941, that all changed and it became impossible. And the only place that you could flee to from Germany, and it wasn't flight at all, the only place you could go outside Germany was Poland to an extermination camp. And so it was the court in Israel that made that distinction that, of course, the International Court of Justice uh, has referred to. And uh, so I, I think that, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm preempting a little bit the discussion you'll have this afternoon, except to, to say that I, I, I think that what we need to do is address the meaning of ethnic cleansing rather than to simply try to suggest, because to, to, to blur that distinction is to adopt a very binary approach that it's either genocide or it's nothing. And, and that's not consistent with the vision of a spectrum. Um, I also don't like disputes like this being using the word denial. The term denial uh, is a term that's, that has developed to deal with anti-Semites anti and Nazi sympathizers who challenge the factual reality of the persecution of the Jews in Germany and elsewhere in Europe 
and it can apply to other environments and other circumstances. Of, uh, I don't think it's really, it, it, it makes the, the debate a little too venomous to use such a term when we're really talking about legal distinctions that have been acknowledged by courts and, and we should have a serene discussion about this rather than, than get into a shouting match with, with terms like that. Well, you might ask, what's the point of a spectrum? Why do you have that? If we look at George Floyd's, at the, at the George Floyd killing and the prosecution of Derek Chauvin, we'll see that one of the distinctions with those three crimes is that each one has a different penalty range. Each one of the three has a different maximum penalty. And while it's probably unlikely that Chauvin, if he's convicted, even of all three would get the maximum penalty because he, 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 it's a first offense, he doesn't have a criminal record, that penalty range will be a guide to judges in establishing the, the gravity, the relative gravity of the crime. It's different at the international level. Uh, I think this is understood, but the international criminal court, if you're on the spectrum, you can get life imprisonment and you can get a suspended sentence or one day in jail. This, the spectrum of penalties uh, is available no matter what the conviction, no matter what the crime, a war crime, a crime against humanity, or the crime of genocide. And judges have resisted the idea that there's a hierarchy. So we often talk about you know, genocide, we say it's the crime of crimes, when you say to people, well, actually, it's better defined as a crime against humanity, they say only a crime against humanity um, and a war crime. No, no, it doesn't do it. It should be genocide. But the judges don't approach it that way. The judges say there's no hierarchy. And they have said on more than one occasion that it's possible that a war crime or a crime against humanity could actually objectively be more serious and deserve a higher penalty than a case of genocide, because each case has to be taken on its own. It may fit the definition, but within that, we have to determine the gravity. And the gravity of something that meets the definition of crimes can be more serious than the gravity of something that meets the definition of genocide under particular circumstances. So why do we have this? You might say, why do we even bother to have a crime of genocide if pretty much everything is covered by crimes against humanity. And I think that's true. Um, it's clear that not everything that meets the definition of genocide, um, that rather not everything that meets the definition of crimes against humanity would meet the definition of genocide because genocide requires physical destruction. Crimes against humanity does not. Crimes against humanity can cover physical destruction. So it has as one of the main acts of crime against humanity extermination and that is pretty largely pretty largely the same thing as what we're talking about with genocide but it also has persecution which which is an act and it has deportation and these are acts that could be committed against an ethnic group with racist motives but not necessarily with a view to destroying the group physically not with a view to exterminating them so everything fits within uh, crimes against humanity, why do we need that definition? And there's a historic explanation. And if you'll, if you'll forgive me for doing this, now I'm going to teach you a little bit of a history lesson. I'm going to go into just a little bit of a his of history for five minutes or so. Both of these notions, essentially all of our definitions of international crimes, and I'm talking now about genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression, go back to a period, very important period in the development of international criminal law in and around the end of the Second World War, when all of these crimes were identified and defined. Uh, and at Nuremberg, they were prosecuted. Now, the term genocide was not, was not in the charter of the International Military Tribunal, which was the, the, the legal uh, framework for the Nuremberg Tribunal. But it was referred to by the prosecutors. It was even referred to by a defense lawyer. And it was widely understood that the genocide, because the term was already been used, it was already, it had been invented in 1944. They were using the term crime against humanity or crimes against humanity. 
the reasons for that are obscure. I don't know that there was ever a formal decision taken saying, let's use the term crime against humanity rather than the term genocide. And I think to a large extent, people viewed them as being rather synonymous, including the man who had defined the term initially, who'd invented it, Raphael Lemkin. There wasn't at that time an official legal definition of genocide, but there was one of crimes against humanity that was what was agreed upon uh, by the four main powers in a conference held in London in July and early August of 1945. And that's what they used to prosecute at Nuremberg. So there's a very interesting discussion that goes on there when they're defining crimes against humanity, which amount to crimes of persecution and destruction of minority groups. And uh, they, the, there's a quotation that uh, I would put up on the screen if you were, if, if you could see it from Robert Jackson, who was the American delegate. He was a sitting justice of the US Supreme Court at the time. And Jackson is nervous about the definition of crime against humanity uh, because he, he says, basically, we have to be careful that what we accuse the Germans of doesn't come back and bite us because of things we're doing to minorities in our countries. And so Jackson said to the other three leaders, of the other three uh, negotiators from the United Kingdom, from France, and from the Soviet Union, he said, we have some regrettable circumstances at times in our own country in which minorities are unfairly treated. So he's being very polite, you know, but what he has in mind, of course, is Jim Crow and lynching. And you're telling me you can see the screen now, correct? Good. So there's the quote. He says, we, you know, it's very noble of him. It's very candid of him to acknowledge this. He did, he was, it was better than what the British and the French and the Russians did. But you could imagine if you were there in the room, what was on their mind? And they're thinking, yeah, I guess we have some regrettable circumstances in our own country too. So here's what Jackson says. He says, we think it's justifiable that we interfere or attempt to bring retribution to individuals or to states only because the concentration camps and the deportations were in pursuance of a common plan or enterprise of making an unjust or illegal war. We involved, we see no other basis on which we are justified in reaching the atrocities which were committed inside Germany under German law or even in violation of German law by authorities of the German state. What is he saying? What we're defining and what we're gonna prosecute the Germans for, you can't prosecute us for Jim Crow and for lynching in the United States because we didn't wage an unjust or an illegal war. That was it. And it was a cynical limitation. And he immediately found the agreement of the French and the British and the Soviets. And that's what they did at the trial. And one of the people who was furious about this was Raphael Lemkin, the man who invented the term genocide. So Lemkin, he was at the, he was at the Nuremberg trial. And when they issued the judgment, he was furious. And he rushed back to New York, where he was living at the time. And he campaigned for a resolution in the General Assembly of the United Nations on genocide. So can you see my next slide? General Assembly 46, well done. There were two, this is the first session of the United Nations General Assembly, the very first session. And it's held in New York, not in the building uh, that you all know, that wasn't built. It was held in a, in, a, in a gyroscope factory out somewhere in Queens, uh, at a place called Lake Success in Queens, in New York. And uh, they adopted two resolutions at that session on international justice. One of them is called the Nuremberg Principles. It was proposed by the United States. And the other is the crime of genocide. It was proposed by India, Panama, and Cuba. The Nuremberg Principles confirmed what Robert Jackson said the year before. They confirmed that it was a violation of international law to commit atrocities against minorities in your own country if it was in the context of waging an aggressive war. That's what it confirmed. 
and it's no surprise that it was proposed by the United States. The crime of genocide was proposed by countries that weren't part of that Nuremberg trial, countries of the global south. This is a north-south split. And the countries of the south, when their delegate, Ernesto de Higo of Cuba, stood up and spoke, he said in the General Assembly that this is to fix the Nuremberg trials. He said at the Nuremberg trials, it had not been possible to punish certain cases of genocide because they'd been committed before the beginning of the war. And he said, let's, let's recognize it as an international crime. And so they adopt the resolu resolution 96. When uh, people see these two resolutions, they often see them as being kind of twins. They, they belong together, but I see it differently. First of all, I'm very struck by the North-South split that one resolution comes from the North and one comes to the South. And when I think about the consequences of it, what I would say is that resolution 95, resolution 96 on the crime of genocide is saying black lives matter. And resolution 95 is saying black lives don't matter. That's the difference. So this is not a spectrum. We don't have a spectrum in 1946. The law that, that develops after the Second World War doesn't produce a spectrum. It has one extreme, it has bright red. That's the crime of genocide, which can be committed in peacetime, but which involves the extermination, the destruction of a group. And then we have the crime against humanity of persecution and of extermination of any group, but it can only be committed in association with an aggressive war. That's at the far dark purple end of the spectrum. And in between, nothing. In between, we have nothing. It's not a spectrum. And that's, that situation prevails legally for about 40 years until the 1990s. What happens in the 1990s is that that spectrum, we get a spectrum, finally. And what happens in the 1990s is we get the spectrum where all of the atrocities committed against national, ethnic, racial, and religious groups, as well as political groups and other groups, gender-based groups, sexual minorities, and so on, get covered by an expansion of the definition of crime against humanity. I was at the Rome conference where the, where the Rome statute was adopted, and I can vividly remember people saying, let's, let's amend the definition of genocide. And delegates, one after another, said, no, 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 just leave it alone. We can cover everything we want to now with this expanded definition of crimes against humanity. There's no need to do it. Let's leave it alone. And so this, I think, I, I'm trying to explain. To me, it provides a good explanation of why we have the spectrum and why we have this now quite sophisticated body of law where international courts have, in some circumstances, the Srebrenica massacre in, in the former Yugoslavia and Bosnia and Herzegovina and the killing of the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994, international courts have had little difficulty concluding that that's genocide. But when we're dealing with cases of expulsion, deportation, I'll use the term again, ethnic cleansing, because I think it's a useful term when we're using, when we find that going on, but we don't have the evidence of physical, of the intent to physically exterminate the group, we call it crime against humanity. That's the law as it is, not maybe as some would like it to be. That's what it is. Let me just, and I'm going to conclude with this. This is my final slide. Um, the difficulty with genocide, and this is always going to be the case uh, in distinguishing genocide from other crimes on the spectrum is proving the intent. Because we require for genocide that you prove the intent to physically destroy the group. We don't require that for crimes against humanity. We don't require that for war crimes. And we certainly don't require it for the crime of aggression. And proving that is not always straightforward. It's not peculiar, by the way, to the crime of genocide. It's the same problem that the prosecutor has in Minneapolis in the Derek Chauvin case. It's proving the intent. The difference between those three crimes with which he's charged and the reason why he's not charged 
With first degree murder, is the ability to prove the intent. What did he intend to do? Was he negligent? Was it an accident? Did he mean to kill Derek? Did he mean to, to kill George Floyd? Did he mean to kill George Floyd because he's a racist? Did he plan to kill him? All of those are questions. Short of having a confession by him, and as you know, he didn't testify. Short of him going on, on Twitter or on Facebook, as some serial killers do from time to time, to tell us what they want to do and what they mean to do, all we can do is infer the intent from their conduct. And what you're, the problem you confront when you're dealing with a crime like this, like genocide, or for that matter, first degree murder, is that proving based on circumstantial evidence, what the International Court of Justice calls a pattern of conduct, proving the intent to commit genocide means you have to rule out the other explanations. You have to show that it couldn't be another explanation. And you're going to find in most of the borderline cases where people are debating, the, the issue was not, could it have been genocide? Could it be genocide? You know, in the report of the fact-finding mission to the Human Rights Council on, on Myanmar, the, the commission said, it could be genocide. A court should determine that. That doesn't mean it is genocide. It means it could be. And the question is, can you eliminate the other explanations? There's a report published by a think tank or by a group of lawyers in London that people are quoting that talks about the allegations of genocide in uh, China, against uh, China in, of the Uyghur. And they say in their uh, report that, there, that it's arguably a case of genocide. Arguably, they're not certain, but actually to go to court and win the case on that, you have to be pretty certain. And it's not enough to say it's an arguable case or it could be genocide. You know, it could be that Derek Chauvin meant to commit genocide. I couldn't rule it out, but we have no evidence to say that, and it's very hard to deduce that, to infer that from his conduct. And that's that's going to be the, the obstacle. So the issue what, that we have to ask is not, is there some evidence that suggests it might be genocide or that it could be genocide, but can we rule out the alternatives? And that's the way I think you have to approach it. now. Um, people are, maybe you will in the question period, they, I get asked regularly by people, is this genocide? Not just the obvious cases of the Uyghur and of the, of the uh, in Myanmar, but many other circumstances. In Pakistan, I was recently asked about genocide against the Pakistanis in Kashmir. Um, but there are many, many examples, historic examples. And um, I, I don't like being asked such questions because I don't like trying to answer them. Um, I don't know what the facts are usually, really, what the facts that have been given. So what I can, I, can, I can look at someone making an argument and say, do you have a strong case? I can do that. So this is what, what I prefer to do. I recently looked at the Department of State's report that came out two weeks ago about the Uyghur genocide. And there's an allegation there um, that echoes the famous statement by, by Mike Pompeo the day he, his last day in office, where he used the charge of genocide against China. But the report doesn't really explain it. And I have to tell you, it's not a strong case that they make up. They don't explain it in the report. So I'm not taking a position one way or another, is it genocide? I don't know what all the evidence is. I don't know all, what all the evidence is. And when I know what all the evidence is or what someone can submit to me, then I can make an assessment. But I can read a report like the Department of State and say, is that all there is? I mean, they use the word genocide in the executive summary of the section on China. And then they go on to discuss a range of violations of human rights committed against the Uyghur and against others in China dealing with everything from elections to freedom of expression, things that have no relevance to genocide. And then you ask yourself, so what are they on about? 
Well, one of the things that the literature suggests is this detention of perhaps a million Uyghurs in camps. And that's not on its surface an act of genocide. It's not one of the things listed in the definition. Could it be evidence of an intent to destroy the group? Well, it could be evidence. Could it be explained else by other, are there other explanations for it? Probably. Is there, do we know of another country in the world that has a million members of a visible minority in detention? I only know of one other country in the world, the United States of America. So I'm gonna conclude with that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to address your questions on this. This is a, a body of law, as I say, that when I started studying it 28 years ago, was, was, was still a work in progress. It had not stabilized, but it has largely stabilized now. Um, and uh, for, for those who sought a broader definition of genocide, the message from the courts is that, no, they're not gonna go there. The message from the lawmakers, by the way, I give the example of the Rome Conference, is countries aren't interested in broadening the definition of, of the genocide. Countries aren't interested in doing it, and judges aren't interested in doing it. But that's mainly because they're satisfied. It's not because they're, they're in a protective mode. We're, we're no longer in the days of Robert Jackson in 1945. They're prepared to recognize criminal liability for atrocities of all kinds committed in peacetime, but they've just chosen to do it under the term crimes against humanity. So I see there are some questions on the chat. Is that how I should proceed, Brianna? Yes, Did yes. I, um, I can read them aloud to the audience just in case they can't see it for some reason or on the live stream. Um, but thank you so much for a very informative presentation. I certainly learned a lot and I've written some of my own questions down just in case um, people were still thinking of theirs, but we can start off with Dr. Stanton's question, who's actually speaking later today at 3 p.m. if anyone wants to tune in. Um, he asks, why is genocide the only crime for which the International Court of Justice and you think that any other crime must be ruled out? Isn't genocide nearly always accompanied by other crimes? Why do you and the ICJ think that genocide must be mutually exclusive from all other crimes? And then he, he furthers his question by stating, don't states that intend to commit genocide nearly always intend to commit other crimes such as deportation as well. Why shouldn't states be held responsible for both genocide and forcible deportation? Okay, well, thank you. And I see my old friend, Greg Stanton is out there. Hi, Greg, it's nice to see you. And uh, Greg was my predecessor as I think as president of the International Association of Genocide Scholars um, more than a decade ago. Um, well, why is genocide the only crime for which the ICJ and you think that any other crime must be ruled out? I, I, I don't think any other crime should be ruled out. Um, at the International Criminal Court, we wouldn't rule out any other crime. In principle, the International Criminal Court we can prosecute the whole spectrum. It's, it's just like Minneapolis where they can prosecute the whole spectrum of criminal law. And there are probably things that Derek Chauvin could be accused of that he's not even been charged with, that they haven't bothered with, like assault, or like, like misuse of a firearm or something, or I don't know what, a, what a other crimes, but, but there are probably others. They focused on three of them, but absolutely you can. The, the International Court of Justice is a peculiar environment for the crime of genocide because the, the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice is subject to consent from states. Most states in the world have not generally accepted the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Those that have, have absolutely if you find who's the international justice, generally, you can go after them for the whole spectrum of crimes before the International Court of Justice. It's not prohibited. You can charge them under customary law. The problem with the cases of genocide that have come before the International Court of Justice to date is that they've dealt with jurisdiction that's based on the Genocide Convention. 
because there's a clause in the genocide convention that says that states that ratify the convention have accepted the jurisdiction of the court, accept the jurisdiction of the court. And there are, what, 150 states that have ratified the genocide convention, and a large proportion of them have done it without a reservation to the article in question, Article 9. So Article 9, uh, some states have made reservations. One of them is China. So you can't get China at the International Court of Justice, even for genocide. Another one is the United States. You can't get the United States at the International Court of Justice for genocide. If you could, there would probably be states charging each other. Maybe the U.S. would charge China and China would reciprocate by charging the U.S. for all I know. But we can't do it because we're locked into that convention. Many states, I said only about a third of the states have generally accepted the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. More than half states have accepted the Genocide Convention. So there's a, a large number of states, perhaps 60 or 70, that you can go after for genocide, but you can't go after for the other violations because they haven't accepted the general jurisdiction of the court. I'm sorry if this sounds technical, but it's based on the consent of states, and we have to live with that. So that, so Greg is saying, maybe you're clarifying this. Let me just read this. I recognize the ICJ only has jurisdiction over violations of the Genocide Convention, but the question is why to find genocide do you think that all other intents and crimes must be ruled out? Well, I don't know if we, we're, we're fully understanding each other, but I think the issue is if you can't determine that there's the, the genocide is being committed, then the court is without jurisdiction. It doesn't have jurisdiction to conclude that other crimes were committed. You know, it's like, I'm trying to think of, a, of an exa historic example. I mean, at Nuremberg, at Nuremberg, the judges heard evidence that crimes had been committed, that, that atrocities had been committed by the Soviet Union, the Katyn massacre. They heard a whole day of testimony that the Soviet Union had committed genocide, or not genocide, but they had committed war crimes at Katyn. Uh, in the famous Katyn massacre. And we know they did because they later admitted it. But the court didn't have jurisdiction to rule on it because the, the court only had jurisdiction over war crimes committed by major German war criminals. It's the way the court is defined. That's all. Um, so the court has the International Court of Justice rules on this narrow issue. And unfortunately, it's not open to rule on whether or not and whether or not they're on the spectrum, whether or not Myanmar or any other country is on the spectrum. You can generally do that at the International Criminal Court, but you can't do it at the International Court of Justice when the jurisdiction is based on the Genocide Convention. If it's based, if the jurisdiction is based on the general clause of jurisdiction, which has been accepted by about 70 countries, yeah, then you can do it. Thank you, Professor. Um, I believe Thank we you. have time for one more question, and I'm going to snag that opportunity as I see no one else has asked a question. But um, we talk about this spectrum of different crimes, and I believe that there's also a possibility of, well, maybe you would disagree with me, and this is why I'm asking. Do you find that there is a balance between the objective nature of law and the need for reconciliation um, for victims? So, for example, if if people of a certain atrocity almost need that label of genocide to heal, but in some situations that label may not apply legally, how do we how do we balance that um, scale of trying to help victims recover and label what's happened to them while also sit, staying true to what the law outlines? I I, I, I think I understand your your point, and I. I'm... I don't think we profoundly disagree on this. I, I, I think it is a very real problem. Um, I think, let me give you an example. Uh, we, had the, we have the example of uh, the, the case that was taken by Bosnia against Serbia in, in 2007, judgment of the International Court of Justice. There's no doubt that the victims, in, um, the, the victims not just of the Srebrenica 
genocide, which was labeled genocide by the, by the judges, but of the other acts, which the court refused to consider to be genocide, and therefore ruled that it had no jurisdiction, the problem I was addressing uh, with Greg Stanton's question, and victims, I think in Bosnia, were heartbroken, victims of, of ethnic cleansing, of deportation, of persecution, whatever you choose to call the crime, they were, for them, it was a defeat, you know, for them, it was, it, it was a setback. And I think that was quite tragic that that happened. I think that maybe part of the problem is that of the activists who raise the expectations of victims um, in a, in an unrealistic way. I think that one of the things that we could do a better job of doing is saying to people, don't treat crimes against humanity like the wooden medal and genocide like the gold medal. Crimes against humanity are, are as serious as it gets. They're the crimes the Nazis were convicted of. If, if we want if we want a, a paradigm for evil, it's still the Nazis. That's what they were convicted of. And, and to, to try to enhance that and to explain to victims, say, there are some distinctions and it may be technical. It's like, you know, think, think again, I'm sorry, maybe I'm, I'm overworking the George Floyd comparison, but it seems to me there are many, there are probably many people there, many people in the United States who think that Derek Chauvin murdered, murdered, first degree murder. Uh, and, and who will be disappointed. They'll be disappointed with a, a conviction for manslaughter, with a sentence of six or seven years, knowing that he'll get out on parole after two years for murdering, for killing a black man in the, in the brutal way he did as part of a pattern of racist murders. But that's law, that's how law operates. And, uh, you know, I think, I think we, Sometimes it's it's my career is working before international courts in various ways, contributing to them, creating them. And sometimes I feel that we've we create too many expectations about them as being the place to go and the place where they're going to get um, full satisfaction. It's probably not accurate. It's a piece, it's a part, part of it, and it's important. Um, just as I'm sure lots of, I mean, I think a lot of victims of, of the of the Nazi genocide, to use that term, mainly Jews, but others as well who were victims of genocide committed by the Nazis, if they actually read the, the judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal, they would be disappointed too. They would say they convicted those bastards, but the judgment isn't really, there's a little bit in there. It's not ignored, but they didn't really do a proper job of a judgment on the Holocaust. The Eichmann judgment, much better in that respect, because it was it was solely about that. But the Nuremberg judgment, in a way, is a is a disappointment too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of our problem. And uh, you know, if we look look at the at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, did a did a great job, very productive, by the way, when we compare it with the International Criminal Court. But lots of people slipped through the net there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one of the cases I did, I, I was arguing for a broad definition of genocide uh, because we were arguing before the National Court of Justice in 2015 that the ethnic cleansing of the Serbs from southern Croatia, what was called the Kraina, that this was an act of extermination. We didn't succeed before the court. We argued that. But that's gone on largely unpunished. A, a, a terrible ethnic cleansing of a, perhaps 100,000 people. And it wasn't ever adequately prosecuted by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. They tried. The prosecutor brought a few cases. There were some convictions that were overturned on appeal. And victims are disappointed. I think maybe it's very good for us to give victims a warning saying, you know, you might win, but don't be heartbroken if we don't succeed because there are too many technical issues here and uh, we'll do our best but but don't 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 bet on it
Yes, yeah, based on, um, I really like that answer because genocide has become the highest crime despite it not being intentionally so. And so I think we need to evil, uh, even the playing field in a way and understand that crimes against humanity are just as severe. Um, but thank you so much for your presentation and your time. Can I just, can thank I you, just audience. Conclude, for, yeah. mm -hmm. Can I just say one last, just one sentence? I know we're at the end of the time. It's kind of the point I was trying to make with my little history lesson and that point where I said there was no spectrum mm -hmm. between 19, the 1940s and the 1990s. I think that's why genocide was, was viewed and, and as, as being such a, a central crime and the others as being insignificant. That was not an inaccurate description of the reality, the legal reality in the 1950s, 60s, 70s and 1980s, but it isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think that the popular conscience hasn't quite caught up with the legal realities, and that's it's the job of people like myself and others to try and 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 make that clearer to people. We do our best. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's an it's an honor to host you, and I speak on my behalf as well as Yukon. Um, so the recording will be posted on our website in the live stream will be on YouTube and for any other information, please check out our website. Um, but thanks again, Professor, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you.